It's a privilege to share God's word with you, but it's also an awesome responsibility. And therefore, I ask you to let us pray as we open his word. Our Father, through the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, we ask as we come this morning that by your spirit, your word may be declared with clarity and simplicity, and that it may be received joyously by willing and obedient hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'd like to speak to you on the topic, <clears throat> the love of God in us, from us, and through us. The love of God in us, from us, and through us. With reference to that title, someone might be just saying, oh no, not another message about love. We've heard it so many times. What new can be said this morning about this topic? Well, it's very likely that I may not be saying anything new. But you may have observed, or I urge you to observe, the next time you read the Gospels, how the Master Teacher, or Lord Jesus Christ himself, in his craft of teaching, repeats over and over the things that have been taught before. Yes, part of effective teaching is repetition. So we hope we are not disturbed by repetition. Additionally, the idea of God and love is inseparable. In fact, the Bible not only says that God loves, <clears throat> but it also says that God is love. John says that in 1 John 4, 8, which reads, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And of course, we all know John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one dege dege son for us all. Now, some time ago, I asked my Belizean grandson if he knew what dege dege meant. And he said, yes, grandpa. If he didn't, I would have had to reprimand his father, who is my son, about not passing on this beautiful language. For anyone who does not know what dege dege means, it means one and only, the only son. In Jeremiah 9, God says that he practices steadfast love. He practices steadfast love. And in Exodus 34, 6 and onwards, God speaking to Moses about his character says that he is abounding in steadfast love. So yes, it is always appropriate and timely to speak about love. I've also chosen as our text, as you heard a while ago, though I'll be quoting other scriptures this morning, one of the most well-known parables of Jesus called the parable of the Good Samaritan. This parable was told by Jesus in response to a question by a lawyer, the question being, who is my neighbor? There was an earlier question by the lawyer, and the narrative says the reason for the question was to test him, implying that they were not genuine questions. Lawyer in the context that we have this morning is not lawyer as we know today who goes to court and defend their client. These lawyers were supposedly expert in the Jewish law, which were given to Moses by God to give to the people. And I understand much, many of them were added. In fact, I understand they were numbered in the 600s, over 600. So you needed somebody to interpret these laws. So the first question to Jesus, which was intended to test him was, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responded, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, you're the expert on the law. How do you understand it? This encounter reminds me of the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John 3, 
When Jesus told him about how to be born again, Nicodemus asked, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? You know, you should in your position, he was saying. So in reply to the lawyer's question, how to inherit eternal life, Jesus asks him, how do you understand the law? He replied by quoting the first and second commandments of love for God and loving one's neighbor as oneself. You have understood correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Here, his lack of genuineness is exposed again in his second question, as in the first. Remember the first question, the reason was because they wanted to test him. The second question, the reason is given in verse 29. Wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? This is a question that caused Jesus to tell this parable that we have for our text this morning about the good Samaritan. In this parable, there are three main characters I'd like to re reference in the parable. Firstly, the priest. Secondly, the Levite, and then the Samaritan. The journey described in the parable by Jesus, Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho, is notorious for the event described, robbery and mayhem. The man who was robbed and beaten and left for dead. The first character is the priest. He's a religious leader in the nation of Israel, charged with teaching and leading the spiritual life of the nation and carrying out the functions required in the temple and directing the people to know, love, and serve the Lord. He passes the man on the other side. Then comes the Levite. He also passes the man just like the priest did. Both of these men are from the tribe of Levi. However, only the descendant of Aaron Remember, Aaron was a Levite, was from the tribe of Levite, but the priest can only be descended from the, the Aaron directly. The other Levites are assistants to the priest. But note, both of these men, are, their full-time occupation was to represent God and his ways to the people. Now we come to the Samaritan. Note five things that happened in relation to the Samaritan and this injured man. First, he felt compassion. One description of self-passion of compassion is a sympathetic pity and a concern for the sufferings and misfortune of others. A sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortune of others. So he felt compassion, number one. Secondly, he bandaged up the wounds of the man and dressed it. Thirdly, he puts him on his beast, probably a donkey. Fourthly, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And lastly, he gives the innkeeper a certain amount of money to care for this injured man and leaves, promising to return and pay for any additional costs that may have accrued from his care. Who is a Samaritan? A brief history. After the reign of Solomon over the Israel, the nation was divided into two kingdoms, the north and the south, 10 tribes to the north and two to the south. The southern tribes were Judah and Benjamin. Both kingdoms under various kings departed from the worship of the true God. Though the northern kingdom was considerably more sinful than the south, through various prophets, God warned them of pending judgment if they did not repent. Having not heeded, God caused the Assyrians to invade and capture the northern kingdom and took away some of the people to Assyria. They left some of them in the land, but brought in the Assyrians 
who intermarried with the Israelites who lost their Jewish identity. Some years after, Nebuchadnezzar conquered the southern kingdom and took away captives to Babylon. And most of us are familiar with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is where those narratives originated. After 70 years in Babylon, God caused a remnant to return to Jerusalem to build the temple. By that time, the now mixed race people living in the former northern kingdom had become known as the Samaritans, taking the name of the former capital. Their offer to their cousins, the returning Jews from Babylon, to build the temple was flatly refused. The, the Jews despised them. So despised were the Samaritans that after they came, they occupied Judea, which was to the south, and Galilee to the north, which you get your name from. In the middle, there was the Samar Samaria with the Samaritans. Now, there's a lot of traveling between the north and the south for worship and commerce and all of that. And they avoided Samaria like the plague. They either went to the east by take the river Jordan ran there and took the boat, avoided Samaria, or on land, but they avoided Samaria. We get a glimpse of this hatred playing out in John 4 with Jesus' interaction with the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. Most of us know that. We all made songs about it. There, the, 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 in John 4, 9, it reads, Therefore, the Samaritan woman said, she's speaking to Jesus, how is it that you being a Jew ask for me, for me a, a drink since I'm a Samaritan? And in parenthesis, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. One of the worst insult that you could give to a Jew was to call him a Samaritan. In fact, once when Jesus exposed the hypocrisy of the Jews, their response was in John 8, verse 48. They are now responding to Jesus because they did not like when Jesus exposed their hypocrisy. They said to him, are, are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan and a demon? They equated Samaritans with demons and they were saying to Jesus, in insulting Jesus, you're a Samaritan. It is this despised man in the parable that Jesus uses to save the battered and bruised man. While the priest and the Levite, God's representative, passed by. Then Jesus asks the lawyer in verses 37 and 30. 6 and 37 of our text. Which of the three do you think proved to be the neighbor of the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the man who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Can you imagine the indignation of those who listen to the parable that Jesus should make out the Samaritan to be more godly than the priest and the Levite? And they should go and imitate the Samaritan, do likewise. Jesus in the parable changed the whole narrative, the concept of who is a neighbor. For them, a neighbor should be someone like them in their class. The tax collector, the prostitute, the Gentile, the Samaritans should be hated. And God commands as a second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So this question echoes down the corridors of history even today. Who is my neighbor? And whom should I be a neighbor to? Who is God commanding us at Galilee, at Elim, to love? 
who is our neighbor? Let's focus for a moment on the relationship with God's command. God commands us to love. Let's focus on God's command. If I were to ask you as believers this morning, if you love God, some people might be offended. Some may answer, I've been saved for 20, 30, 40 years. But the question is still, do you love the Lord? <clears throat> well, I've served him in various ministries in the church, <clears throat> but do you love the Lord? While some of these activities may indeed be indicative of love for the Lord, they do not always do. What does it mean to have love, to show love for God? What, what does that mean? Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Son, gives a clear, uncomplicated answer. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Follow me as we, we examine this God man, this perfect man, Jesus Christ, how he showed love for his father. Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, that it is the will of God that his children be conformed or made into the image of Christ. What does this image look like that we should be made into? All through the life of Jesus, nothing consumed him more than doing the will of the Father. Nothing consumed him more than obedience to God. They were like bookends in his life. At age 12, we hear him saying to his earthly guardian, Mary and Joseph, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And in the Garden of Gethsemane, shortly before his death, we hear him saying to his father, nevertheless, not your will, not my will, but yours be done. The disobedience of Adam and Eve to God plunged the whole of mankind into the chaos that we experience today. Conversely, the obedience of Jesus has given hope for a reversal of what Adam did. Therefore, to be conformed to the image of Christ, which is the will of God for us, is to be a people consumed with a desire to obey God. That is how we show love for God. Nothing wrong with saying, I love God. But we can say it over and over again and still don't. The criteria for showing love for God is obedience to God. So to the extent that we study the word of God with a desire to understand what it says in order to obey God's word, is demonstrating love for God. Someone has said, spiritual knowledge must precede practical application. Spiritual knowledge must precede practical application. For what is not properly understood cannot be properly applied. The word of God, brothers and sisters, is not about a book of suggestions. They are God's command. One of the greatest flaws among believers is what I call selective obedience, where we pick and choose what to obey. But selective obedience is plain disobedience. And put it plainly, it is sin, and therefore robs us of our relationship with God and with others. When we don't see sin as sin, we don't repent, which is a remedy for sin. James, in defining what sin is, he says in James 4.17, whoever knows what is the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let us examine ourselves this morning and ask, who is our neighbor? Do we love our neighbor? In light of 
the relationship with our neighbor, do we love God? Let me now direct our attention to the love for those in the family of God. This unique relationship and love that we should have for fellow believers. Paul writing to the Galatians in Galatians 6.10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. It is not by, by chance that we refer to each other as brothers and sisters. It is because we have the same father who is God. Again, the inseparable link between love for God and man is made powerful by the writings of the Apostle John. In 1 John 4, 20 and 21, he writes, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have of him, of God, whoever loves God must love his brother also. End of quote. So to love one's brother or sister is a command from God, is not a request, is not a suggestion. What is it that the Bible teaches about this most precious relationship? The word of God abounds with such teachings, and we'll examine a few. It is said of the early church, as the world observed them, they remarked how they loved each other. Writing to the Colossians, Paul writes in Colossians 1, 3 and 4, we thank God the Father for Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Obviously, this love was not a secret love, but an abounding love that Paul was felt compelled to commend them for. To the Thessalonians, he write in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, remembering before God and Father your work of faith and your labor of love. And in 2 Thessalonians, he speaks of the increasing love they have for the saints. Just imagine the possible impact on communities that it would have if those who observed us as children of God should say how much they love each other. Love gets involved in each other's life, not in an interfering way, but in, with wisdom. You know, there's an inexplicable attraction that exists between people that causes persons to gravitate to each other. And we should give place for that to happen. But it, we should be careful that it does not act as an exclusion to others. Many years ago, while I was a deacon at Elim, I realized that there were members of the church, a number of my brothers and sisters, who I've never really got to know very well. I knew them, we said hi, hello. Never had a lengthy conversation for them, you know? I knew them, but I didn't know them. So I decided one week that I'd select six of these persons to call them in the following week and inquire about their welfare, how they were getting on, getting to know them. After speaking to them for a while, almost all of them, you know what they were asking? What is the real reason why you're called? You know? And they couldn't believe that the real reason was to call them, to find out how they're getting on. Now, I've not told this, this incident to you for you to think what a great guy I am, but it's rather a rebuke to me for it having taken me so long to have done what should have been normal. It is sad 
that that which should be the ordinary in the community of God's people has become the extraordinary. When we ask a person, how are you doing? Are we hoping that they will say fine? Because if they say otherwise, we'll be compelled to be involved in their situation. On the other hand, when we're asked if we're fine, do we respond fine because we do not expect help or involvement by other persons? Or we're too proud to say we need help? Or we do not expect grace and compassion from others, so we don't bother? On the other hand, too, do some of us exploit the kindness and love of those who are always willing to help? These are tough questions I'm asking, but you know, I can afford to ask it because in a few minutes, I'll be out of here and you know, you'll either forgive me or forget the next time I speak. So I'm brave enough to say that. But seriously, these are very important questions. Listen to what Jesus had to say about the relationship that he desires to exist between us, his people. In fact, he makes it a matter of prayer to his father. John 17, which is called the, the, high, priest, therefore, the high priest prayer of our Lord. He prays about many things, and I commend you to study this prayer and meditate on it. Meditate on it. It's the longest of our Lord's recorded prayer. It's beautiful. It's awesome. He prays for his inner circle disciples, numbering now, what, 11 or 12? In verses 20, 21 and 23, listen to what the Lord says as he prays to his father. John 17, 20. I do not ask for these alone, that is, those of his little followers there, 12. He said, I do not ask for these alone, whatever he had asked for previously, but also for those who will believe on me through his word. That is us. All of us who have believed have believed because of these men who wrote the, the scriptures and were led by God. All of us who believe it can be led back to them. So he says, I do not pray for those alone, but he's praying for us, those of us who believe on his word. Verse 21, that they may be one, just as you, Father, and are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. What an amazing prayer. In other words, the unity, the love that exists between the Father and Son is what Jesus prays for that should exist between us as God's children. Amazing indeed. Are we working towards this fulfillment of this prayer? Indeed, it is the indwelling Holy Spirit that enables any semblance of that to be achieved. This is borne out in Paul's writing in Galatians 5.22. Heading the list of the fruit of the Spirit is love, followed by joy. And the two are inextricably linked. There is no true joy where there is an absence of love. Could that be the reason why so many of God's people are joyless? We have already discussed what it means to show love to God. Obedience. What does it mean to show love to our brothers and sisters in a, a practical way? We can run up our mouth about love all we like, but what does it mean? Clarity abounds from another well-known scripture, which we all know. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. In it, Paul's lists activities in which one can be engaged, and yet concludes that if love is absent, they are worth nothing. How do we show love? Love in action. Paul says love is, kind, is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. John makes an astounding statement in John 1, 1 John 4, 8. I think I read it before. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Let me close by reading some verses in 1 John 3, where John links our love for brothers and sisters. Let me repeat this. John links our love to our brothers and sisters to the very genuineness of our salvation. John, 1 John 3, 14 to 18, and verse 23. He writes, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love our brothers, our brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in it. By this we know that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has requested, huh? as he has wished, no, as he has commanded us. So as I close, I ask us, ask that we contemplate these questions. Who is my neighbor? What's the definition of neighbor? Biblical definition, Jesus' definition. Who is my neighbor? Do I love my neighbor? Do I love my brothers and sisters with whom I share a common father who is God? Am I demonstrating my love for God by loving and obeying his clear commands? This I believe my brothers and sisters is the door through which we enter for a joyous, fulfilling relationship with God. Amen. Everyone just say it.